Hey folks, uh, I'm here for the fifth chapter of the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde called The Incident of the Letter. If you recall, chapter four was called The Carew Murder Case, uh, in which a man named Sir Danvers Carew was murdered uh, by Edward Hyde, and um, he was carrying a letter to Utterson. Apparently, Utterson was his lawyer at the time, and so the police involved Mr. Utterson, who ended up taking them to Hyde's residence, where the whole place had been ransacked and information burned. Um, they tried to wait for Hyde at the bank. He never showed up, and uh, they tried to, um, you know, uh, put out handbills or wanted posters, but nobody could describe him, and he didn't have any family, and uh, he didn't have any friends, and so it was sort of a complicated thing that, that never uh, got off the ground. Uh, and so this is going to be the next chapter in the mystery. At this point, a pretty pretty thumping good mystery. We don't know who Hyde is. We don't know what kind of power he has over Jekyll. We don't know where he came from. Um, there are a lot of questions going on here. We just know that he has an intimate relationship with Jekyll because he has some artwork that Jekyll purchased on his wall. Uh, he has a cane that Utterson himself gave to Jekyll, which he used to, to commit the murder. Half of it was found on the murder at the murder scene and half of it in Hyde's apartment. Um, you know, so there, there are all these connections and things going on, but it's a really difficult uh, murder to solve. Uh, which brings us to the incident of the letter. It was late in the afternoon when Mr. Utterson found his way to Dr. Jekyll's door, where he was at once admitted by Poole and carried down by the kitchen offices and across the yard, which had once been a garden, to the building, which was indifferently known as the laboratory or dissecting rooms. The doctor had bought the house from the heirs of a celebrated surgeon, and his own taste being rather chemical than anatomical, had changed the, de sorry, the destination of the block at the bottom of the garden. So the building at the at the bottom of the garden, as I said before, uh, used to be called the dissecting rooms because this was a, a house that was owned by a famous surgeon, and that's where he did a lot of his work. Actually, this is sort of uh, disturbing information, maybe. Uh, but uh, the better surgeons, the better doctors in London uh, tended to have their surgery occur in rooms that had sort of like amphitheater bleacher seating and other people who wanted to become doctors would come and observe what was going on in fact benjamin franklin was involved in in this i think a couple of times and wrote about it which is which is kind of cool uh but anyway uh, jekyll bought a surgeon's house and so the office that was attached to it was referred to as the dissecting rooms and he has changed its name to the laboratory because remember he's a chemist not a medical doctor so we talk call him dr jekyll but he's not a doctor in, in the medicinal sense. He's a doctor. Hold on one second. My dog is making a ton of noise. Sorry about that. The dangers of recording in the kitchen after, after dinner. Um, anyway, so we'll, uh, we'll pick back up here. Um, change the destination of the, of the block at the bottom of the garden. It was the first time that the lawyer had been received in this part of his friend's quarters, and he eyed the dingy windowless structure with curiosity. Remember, this is a structure that had the door from the story of the door on the other side. Um, and gazed around with a distasteful sense of strangeness as he crossed the theater, once crowded with eager students and now lying gaunt and silent, the tables laden with chemical apparatus, the floor strewn with crates and littered with packing straw, and the light falling dimly through the foggy cupola. So um, this was where the surgeries used to happen, and now it's all covered with lab equipment and beakers and test tubes and, you know, all the kind of stuff from like a pseudoscience horror movie. Um, at the further end, a flight of stairs mounted to a door covered with red baize, and through this, Mr. Utterson was at last received into the doctor's cabinet. This is a weird door to be covered with a red baize. Baize is like the material that's on a pool table that's green, except in this case it's red and it's on a door. I don't know. Um, and through this, Mr. Utterson was at last received into the doctor's cabinet. Cabinet is also a weird word. Nowadays, we would use the word study or, or private office. Uh, but back in the day, the word was cabinet. Um, we tend to think of a cabinet as a place where you keep bottles or pills or clothes or towels or something. But that's not what it was, especially in England at the time. So think about cabinet as, as study. Um, maybe that's an easy way to to make that connection because they're going to use the word a lot. Um, it was a large room fitted around with glass presses furnished among other things with a cheval glass and a business table. A cheval glass is sort of like here, maybe I can um, pull up a picture of it and better describe it. 
So a cheval glass is a, is a full length mirror, but you can see how it, it spins around. And traditionally, um, it would either spin around and you'd have one side that's that's a regular mirror and one side that's a close up mirror so that you could see things really close up or the other side would be black. I don't know which kind this is and I don't know that it ever says, uh, but I like to picture the other side as like the close up mirror. Anyway, back to what we were, were reading. So this is a, a minute description of what's inside Dr. Jekyll's cabinet or study. Um, where was I? Um, into his, it was a large room fitted around with glass presses, furnished among other things with a cheval glass and a business table, and looking out upon the court by three dusty windows barred with iron. The fire burned in the grate. A lamp was set lighted on the chimney shelf, for even in the houses the fog began to lie thickly, and there, close up to the warmth, sat Dr. Jekyll, looking deathly sick. He did not rise to meet his visitor, but held out a cold hand and bade him welcome in a changed voice. So Jekyll's all hunched in on himself, cold, and looks looks ill. Um, and now, said Mr. Utterson, as soon as Poole had left them, you have heard the news? The doctor shuddered. They were crying into the square. He said, I heard them in my dining room. One word, said the lawyer. Carew was my client, but so are you, and I want to know what I am doing. You have not been mad enough to hide this fellow. Utterson, I swear to God, cried the doctor, I swear to God I will never set eyes on him again. I bind my honor to you that I am done with him in this world. It is all at an end, and indeed, he does not want my help. You do not know him as I do. He is safe. He is quite safe. And mark my words, he will never more be heard of. The lawyer listened gloomily. He did not like his friend's feverish manner. You seem pretty sure of him, said he, and for your sake, I hope you may be right. If it came to a trial, your name might appear. I am quite sure of him, replied Jekyll. I have grounds for certainty that I cannot share with anyone, but there, there is one thing on which you might advise me. I have, I have received a letter and I am at a loss whether I should show it to the police. I should like it to leave it to your hands, Utterson. You would judge wisely, I am sure. I have so great a trust in you. You fear, I suppose, that it might lead to his detection? Asked the lawyer. No, said the doctor. I cannot say that I care what becomes of Hyde. I am quite done with him. I was thinking of my own character, which this hateful business has rather exposed. Utterson ruminated a while. He was surprised at his friend's selfishness and yet relieved by it. Well, he said at last, let me see the letter. The letter was written in an odd, upright hand and signed Edward Hyde. And it signified briefly enough that the writer's benefactor, Dr. Jekyll, whom he had long so unworthily repaid for a thousand generosities, need labor under no alarm for his safety as he had a means of escape on which he placed a sure dependence. The lawyer liked this letter well enough. It put a better color on the intimacy than he had looked for, and he blamed himself for some of his past suspicions. Have you the envelope? he asked. I burned it, replied Jekyll, before I thought what I was about, but it bore no postmark. The note was handed in, so apparently the note was given to Poole at the door, and Poole took it to um, Jekyll, so it was not sent by the post. Obviously, you know, Utterson was curious as to the postmark where it was sent from um, that might help them come to find Hyde. Um, Shall I keep it and sleep upon it? asked Utterson. I wish you to judge for me entirely, was the reply. I have lost confidence in myself. Well, I shall consider, returned the lawyer. And now, one word more. It was Hyde who dictated the terms in your will about the disappearance. The doctor seemed seized with a qualm of faintness. He shut his mouth tight and nodded. I knew it, said Utterson. He meant to murder you. You had a fine escape. I have had what is far more to the purpose, returned the doctor solemnly. I have had a lesson. Oh, God, Utterson, what a lesson I have had. And he covered his face for a moment with his hands. On his way out, the lawyer stopped and had a word or two with Poole. Remember, Poole's the butler. By the by, said he. There was a letter handed in today. What was the messenger like? But Poole was positive that nothing had come except by post. And only circulars by that, he added, meaning only advertisements. So, this is interesting. 
And Jekyll said the letter was handed to handed in, uh, but Poole, the butler, says he never received the letter. This news sent off the visitor with his fears renewed. Plainly the letter had come by the laboratory door. Possibly, indeed, it had been written in the cabinet. And if that were so, it must be differently judged and handled with more caution. The newsboys, as he went, were crying themselves hoarse along the foot footways. Special edition! Shocking murder of an MP! MP stands for Member of Parliament. That was the funeral oration of one friend and client. And he could not help a certain apprehension lest the good name of another should be sucked down in the eddy of the scandal. It was at least a ticklish decision that he had to make, and self-reliant as he was by habit, he began to cherish a longing for advice. It was not to be had directly, but perhaps he thought it might be fished for. That's a metaphor. Presently, after sorry, presently after, he sat on one side of his own hearth with Mr. Guest, his head clerk, upon the other, and midway between, at a nicely calculated distance from the fire, a bottle of a particular old wine that had long dwelt unsunned in the foundations of his house. The fog still slept on the wing above a dr the drowned city, where the lamps glimmered like carbuncles, and through the muffle and smother of these falling clouds, the procession of the town's life was still rolling in through the great arteries with the sound of a mighty wind. This is a great description of London in the fog, um, and it's almost like a living thing. Its streets are arteries, and, and commerce is flowing in and out of them. Um, fogs are really terrible in Victorian London. There's still fog in London. Uh, London is on a river, and uh, the, the sea fog comes up the river and floats out into London. But in Victorian times, all of London was heated by coal, and coal produces a ton of smoke, and the smoke would mix with the fog, and the fog, instead of sort of being a gray mist, would turn into a brown mist with all this uh, soot hanging in it. And so it became a really dense... Um, sort of inversion of fumes. It was not healthy to breathe, uh, but that's sort of the fog we're talking here, the Jack the Ripper sort of fog. Um, anyway, where was I? The fog still slept on the wing above the drowned city, where the lamps glimmered like carbuncles, and through the muffle and smother of these falling clouds, the procession of the town's life still rolling in through the great arteries of the sound as of a mighty wind. But the room was gay with firelight. In the bottle, the acids were long ago resolved. The imperial dye had softened with time as the color grows richer in stained windows. And the glow of hot autumn afternoons on hillside vineyards was ready to be set free and to disperse the fogs of London. I like this line, too, because it's sort of about the theory of wine. Like, I like the idea of wine. Wine's not my favorite beverage. But I like the idea of wine, right? Like, look at this. He says, um... The glow of hot autumn afternoons on hillside vineyards was ready to be set free and disperse the fogs of London. The idea here, I think, is that when you open a bottle of wine, you're opening a summer from a year past. If you open a bottle of wine from, I don't know, 2001, you're opening a year of the past. And you can, you can sip the wine and remember what was going on the year that those grapes were uh growing and and what that summer was like and it's almost like a, a form of time travel in a way uh and and i think stevenson does a pretty good job of describing that here uh also you know there there are wine bottles from before we were born out there so you could drink something that predates yourself which i think is interesting as well uh anyway um insensibly the lawyer melted obviously that's a metaphor too there was no man from whom he kept fewer secrets than mr guest and he was not always sure that he kept as many as he meant guest had often been on business to the doctors he knew pool he could scarce have failed to hear of mr hyde's familiarity about the house he might draw conclusions was it not well then that he should see a letter which put that mystery to right and above all since guest being a great student and critic of handwriting would consider the step natural and obliging the clerk, besides, was a man of counsel. He could scarce read so strange a document without dropping a remark, and by that remark, Mr. Utterson might shape his future course. So conveniently, from a plot perspective, Mr. Guest, Utterson's head clerk, is a great student of handwriting. There's actually a science of handwriting. Um, let, me, let me flip over to that page and talk about it for a second. You know, graphology, it was sort of a, a, it started in the Victorian age, this idea that you could infer uh, the the character or the personality of somebody from their handwriting. The theory underlying graphology is that the handwriting is the expression of personality, hence a systemic analysis of the way words and letters are formed can reveal traits of personality. Graphologists not 
Note such elements as the size of individual letters and the degree and regularity of slanting ornamentation, angularity, and curvature. Other basic considerations are the general appearance and impression of the writing, the pressure of the upward and downward strokes, and the smoothness of the writing. For example, analytic graphologists interpret large handwriting as a sign of ambition and small handwriting as a sign of pedantry. Graphologists have caution that the validity of handwriting analysis can be subverted by such considerations as myopia and the loss of motor control. In general, the scientific basis for graphologi graphological interpretations of personality is questionable. But it was kind of a, a big and new idea then, and uh, Stevenson's definitely using it in his novel. So Mr. Guest is an expert at understanding handwriting, and uh, he's going to uh, be handed this letter from um, Hyde to Jekyll. And uh, wow, I'm, I'm watching my lips be entirely off where they're supposed to be here. Oh, it looks like it's correcting itself, so hopefully it's not too bad. Um, it's weird, disconcerting seeing yourself up in the corner as you're, as you're reading. Um, <laughs> sorry about that digression. Back to it. Um, let's see. And Guest, being a great student and critic of handwriting, would consider the step natural and obliging. obliging. The clerk, besides, was a man of counsel. He could scarce read so strange a document without dropping a remark, and by that remark, Mr. Utterson might shape his future course. This is a sad business about Sir Danvers, he said. Yes, sir, indeed, it has elicited a great deal of public feeling, returned Guest. The man, of course, was mad. I should like to hear your views on that, replied Utterson. I have a document here in his handwriting. It is between ourselves, for I scarce know what to do about it. It is an ugly business at best, but there it is, quite in your way, a murderer's autograph. Guest's eyes brightened, and he sat down at once and studied it with passion. No, sir, he said, not mad, but it is an odd hand. And by all accounts, a very odd writer, added the lawyer. Just then the servant entered with a note. Is that from Dr. Jekyll, sir, inquired the clerk. I thought I knew the writing. Anything private, Mr. Utterson? Only an invitation to dinner. Why? Do you want to see it? Uh, one moment, I thank you, sir. And the clerk laid the two sheets of paper alongside and sedulously compared their contents. Uh, thank you, sir, he said at last, returning both. It's a very interesting autograph. There was a pause, during which Mr. Utterson struggled with himself. Why did you compare them, guest? he inquired suddenly. Well, sir, returned the clerk, there's a rather singular resemblance. The two hands are in many points identical, only differently sloped. Rather quaint, said Utterson. It is, as you say, rather quaint, returned Guest. I wouldn't speak of this to anyone, you know, said the master. Now, sir, said the clerk, I understand. But no sooner was Mr. Utterson alone that night than he locked the note into his safe, where it reposed from that time forward. What? He thought, Henry Jekyll forged for a murderer? And his blood ran cold in his veins. So, interestingly, the note that was supposedly from Mr. Hyde is actually a note in Dr. Jekyll's handwriting, which means Dr. Jekyll forged the note from Hyde. So, obviously... Um, you know, Utterson decides not to use it as evidence or give it to the police or anything because it's not genuine. It's not even written by Hyde at all. And uh, the fact that, that Jekyll is willing to write a fake note from Hyde, what does this mean? How does this impact the understanding of the case? These are all questions that a Victorian reader would have at this point in the story. Um, and that's going to bring us to the next chapter, the incident of Dr. Lanyon, but that's going to have to wait for next class. We don't have time to get through that one today. Uh, thank you. If you have any questions, drop them down below.